The coronavirus outbreak is the world's first pandemic in a century. And in today's podcast, I'm joined by Mikkel Eriksson, the CEO of Intrum, who's going to tell us about how COVID-19 is affecting Intrum and European consumers' finances. Mikkel, welcome. Thank you. So COVID-19, this is a unique situation for us all. Um, you are the CEO of a pan-European business. Many countries in Europe have been very badly affected by this. How has it affected Intrum? Of course, we have been affected uh, like all companies in Europe or all individuals for that matter. So it's important to focus on um, the most important uh, aspects, and that is, of course, the well-being of our staff. Our balance sheet and liquidity is also very high on that list. And then, of course, our clients and our customers. But what does that mean in, in, in practice? I'm interested. In. Yeah, on a daily basis, you know, we have we help somewhere between 80 and 85,000 clients. That's everything from entrepreneurs to large financial institutions with late payments. And we communicate with approximately 200,000 individuals on a daily basis who have bought something that they have difficulties to pay for. Both those two conversations, if you put it like that, Mm. needs to be with a lot of empathy and has to be dealt with in a proper way, also in situations like that. That is our role in society and in the economies and markets we operate in. And I suppose that kind of leads us more into that role and the mission that that, that, that Intrum has, because it's not really just about kind of, you know, the, the, the core business, as important as that is. There's a, a strong kind of corporate social responsibility that underpins the company. Can you kind of maybe tell us a bit more about those sorts of initiatives? Yeah, one has to remember then that as, as Intrum, as a company, we are only making money when we help someone to start repay the debt that they have accumulated. Okay. Mm-hmm. And if you look at it today, over 70% of all the money that we collect is through amicable agreements. And um, over 80% of the collections is actually through payment plans. And that is what we have agreed with our customers when they start to repay their debts. But if you look at our position in the markets where we operate, where we are, where our DNA is actually pure servicing in the 24 countries in Europe, we see ourselves as a catalyst of a healthy and sound economy where we have we are an integrated part of the financial system in every single country, where we actually bridge between clients and customer in a uh, correct way. Mm-hmm. One of the, the kind of set piece things that, that you do is is to provoke discussion and to, to act really as a sort of barometer for both uh, consumers financial confidence and also those of companies the kind of the two sectors that, that, that you deal with. Um, it might be quite useful to kind of rewind the clock a little bit to, to late 2019 when you uh, released the European Consumer Payment Report. Mm. Um, there were some findings there that, that were perhaps kind of quite interesting. You know, the likes of 45% of consumers said that bills were outpacing income, uh, 52% of people struggling to save each month as they'd like, and and then some people maybe overestimating financial mm. literacy. Mm. Um, these are quite strong findings. Uh, can you comment on those? I mean, are they, are they things that we should be very concerned about? I think in general, late payments is a challenge in the society. It's a challenge for the companies or financial institutions who have sold something that they have difficulties to getting paid for. And of course, it's a huge challenge for the individuals who has bought something that they have difficulties to pay for. Mm -hmm. And I think in today's society, I mean, you have to remember Intrum is a company that's been around for 100 years and we worked with late payments for 100 years. And of course, the markets has developed. Nowadays, cash is not really around. A lot of the economies and the markets operate in, you can say, cashless societies. Credit cards and other forms of payments is the new normal, so to say. Mm -hmm. So credits in different forms are gradually building up in society. So what is so important today, and I think our survey from end of 19 clearly shows that, is the importance of education and that people understand what it actually means to use some sort of credit, whether it's a, you can buy something now, pay in uh, two weeks, or buy now and pay in installments, or buy now and pay with your credit card. 
all of that is credit that forces you to pay later on. And we have to understand the concept of that. And I think in the majority of the countries where we operate today, there is a lack of that knowledge. And I think, honestly, schools and, and education systems have actually some catching up to do here because the, uh, the general education and learning about this is very low in many countries. I mean, I know when I was at school that, that financial literacy wasn't really something that was taught. It was more something that you, you maybe thought would come kind of almost by osmosis mm. from your parents or, or mm. those around you. But Interim's actually getting very actively involved in this, aren't you? You know, in terms of Spendido, the, 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 the kind of classroom tool for financial literacy. Would you like to kind of ex expand on that? We developed and it's basically an educational package for teachers to support them when they teach about financial well-being and, and the consequences of being in debt to the students. But I think we can't, we cannot do this alone. I mean, I think mm. all parties in the markets, whether it's financial institutions, retailers, and, and governments and local municipalities need to join forces to enhance the education. Because we have to remember that the markets are also changing. And the world that our young people meet today is a, is a world without cash and where you actually buy on credit to a much larger extent than I met when I was young. So the market has also changed over time and uh, the importance of education increased. Absolutely. And so, you know, I, mean, I suppose that was the picture in 2019. Mm. And it's been the ongoing picture for some years, obviously, as your reports have shown. But now suddenly, kind of like a sledgehammer, here comes COVID-19. So we're seeing quite a lot of anxiety. Maybe it's not surprising. We're seeing mm. some anxiety about, you know, people maybe losing jobs, obviously, um, reduced working hours, less income, rising bills and, and debts. Um, yet some people are, 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 are spending less because obviously they've got to stay indoors. So what kind of picture is emerging from this? What, what kind of conclusions do you think interim can take and, you know, wider society can take from uh, this sort of pulse survey on the situation. Yeah, we we thought it was um, you know interesting to t to do this kind of pulse survey just to check out how things uh, were out there, and it's clear that the stress from you can say your own financial well being is clearly there, and it of course increases in um, in in these type of circumstances with the COVID nineteen. You mm -hmm. know, it affects people out there. And our services, almost one out of two, is affected from a working, um, you know, perspective. So their work has changed one way or the other as a consequence of COVID-19, and that's actually quite a lot. Mm. And as our survey have shown over the years, is also that it, this is important for the general well-being of people. Are they comfortable with their financial situation? And uh, I think one of the interesting aspects that you alluded to is actually how people react. And we actually see that one out of three increase their savings or reduce their consumption. And that is good because when you are in a stressful situation or when uncertainty increases, you have to take a step back as an individual. I think I've tried to, I think you also try to do that and be a little bit more cautious with what we, how we spend and what we spend at. Or on, and I think that is good, but I think there's still some way to go, and I think the survey clearly shows that the stress has increased in Europe mm -hmm. among the general consumers. But if it's just to pick up on one of your points there, if there's a good thing that comes from it, then it maybe makes people think more about future proofing. They're thinking more about the future. They're maybe beginning, some of them anyway, to think about saving and spending a little bit less. While, of course, we don't want to see, you know, credit collapse or anything else like that. But we, we do encourage people to kind of be a little bit more, you know, maybe think twice and think more about spending. So that's a kind of a consequence that's come from this, right? Yeah, and, and it's good. And it's a logical reaction from individuals. But again, it, when this kind of stressful situation happens, things that we couldn't plan for that we didn't think could actually happen at all 
it is so important that we have some sort of a margin in our financial well-being and our financial status mm. that we always think about that and i think again it shows the importance of education that people are prepared for the unforeseen things to happen that we cannot plan for that happens from time to time i don't think we were experience another COVID-19 situation. I certainly hope we don't, but there will always be situations in our individual lives that, you know, can increase stress in a certain uh, moment. And we have to plan for it and we need to have a margin. And this is about education. People have to understand the consequences of high consumption, indebtedness, borrow money to consume, because it reduces the margin that we have in our lives. Some economies in Europe have got have had structural problems since the credit crunch, mm. 2008, and have only maybe just started to get back onto their feet after this this uh, this situation. And then suddenly they're hit by COVID-19 and the effects, the economic effects. Could mm. you say that there's a, a, a north-south divide um, with regards to the findings of this Pulse survey? Well, I'm. Um yeah, it's you can say it is to some extent, and of course you'll see in southern Europe, uh, you know, has been more affected than northern Europe um, as a consequence of the crisis. The economies has been more affected, and that is also shown in the survey in itself. We've seen it before, and there might be also that the general understanding of you can say personal financial situation in general is higher in the northern part of Europe than in the lower, in, in southern part of Europe. But nevertheless, we see quite a common theme throughout Europe mm. that um, nervousness or uncertainty has increased as yeah. a result of COVID-19. And that's all over the, 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 the Europe, so to say. Mm. And uh, also the lack of general education is actually there in all markets as well. Mm. What about those sort of sectors of society, the kind of maybe more vulnerable sectors of society? What What is the message from Interim and yourself with regards to those sectors? Vulnerable people, regardless of why, is always, always mostly affected when things go bad. And a COVID-19 situation is not an exception in that. And we have to take that with us. And I think as a society, make sure that we have protection around to s help out and support the more vulnerable parts of, uh, of the economy and, and the people in the economy. Mm -hmm. I think that is important. Mm -hmm. From an interim perspective, I mean, we speak to people on a daily basis, as I s said before, and my only advice is call us or call the one that you owe money, you know, early on, you know, speak and talk and take care of the things that you that you have that is the most important part of it you know because then it's much easier for us to help out and address it but i also think we should look at the other side of the equation and that is you know all the entrepreneurs out there in europe all the retailers we don't have to talk necessarily about financial institutions, but there are so many companies out there who is trying to sell things on a daily basis who actually form part of our economy, who are difficult, more difficult to sell things today, mm. and of course also are at risk of having more difficulties to getting paid. So it's also important that we have to remember that for markets and economies, you know, to keep on moving and growing, we need all these companies to prosper over time. So you know, economies need to work and we need to get the wheels back turning. That is so important. And, and, and quite often when we see consumer surveys, people tend to think that it's only the consumers that are affected. But what you're saying there is that this has got a ripple effect, obviously, in terms of retailers, in terms of, you know, those business, businesses that are selling to consumers. So really, it's, it, it's, it's a very timely survey that, that people can maybe kind of uh, you know, prick up their ears and, 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 and be aware of, of, of what's going on, right? Yeah, and you have two sides of the coin in the sense. Someone who's trying to sell something, someone who's buying it, who's trying to pay for it. But, and if you look at it, the ones that actually are selling things is actually the all the companies around in the markets around in Europe. And one out of two of the consumers are actually a little bit concerned with the work. And they are affected, they feel, of the COVID-19 in the daily work. 
And that's also part of it because, you know, if, if you're a customer out there and you are difficult to pay your bills, if you're also a little bit anxious about your working situation or feel that your work has changed, you know, condition has changed, it's also affecting your well-being, your financial well-being and how you actually are, are feeling and doing. So it's actually part of the market. And coming back to us as interim, here we see ourselves as a catalyst of a sound economy in the mean, helping the clients to get paid for the goods, but also supporting the customers who's bought something to be able to gradually repay them and come back in order again. So for us, this is a situation where we always work with and we see ourselves as a central part of it. So do you feel that, although it's a very testing time, that the fact that you guys have been working towards this end um, that you're ready to face this crisis, that you can do the advocacy work, you can do the core work. What's your kind of feelings regards to no, that? No, but absolutely, you're right. And of course, we prepare our organization for, you know, first of all, in a short perspective, to make sure that we meet the situation with the empathy necessary, both in terms of in our communication with our clients, but also with our customers. But secondly, that we also prepare ourselves for the, I say, year, years to come, where we actually see the potential of growing, you know, problematic credits in the society where financial institutions or retailers will have more difficulties to get paid for the goods. So there will be larger volumes for us to work with. So we are also preparing for that, which is also part of our job. Mm, absolutely. So if we look at a sound economy and how we achieve it with regards to society. If there was one kind of word, a kind of magic word or whatever it would be, what would be the kind of the phrase, if you like, how do we achieve a sound economy in society? And the most important thing is, in your view? I, well, I think it is education. Um, but, uh, and I think that, you know, if, if you have the understanding and the consequences, both as a client you know, and as a customer, it makes things so much easier. Because mm. if you have the knowledge and the understanding, then you also know how to deal with a certain situation and what you can do and what you cannot do. And that gives you much more comfort uh, in your daily activities. So I think education and understanding, and I keep urging people to really get into the details. They might be boring, but they should get into the details of the consequences when they buy things on credit or in, in installments. You know, you have to understand the underlying conditions on that. All of us are a bit bad at reading the fine print, aren't we, at times? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. There's a reason there are fine prints. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in follow up, kind of what, what is your overall message to listeners? And I'm not just talking about consumers as vitally important as they are, but maybe kind of opinion makers, you know, people in politics, government, uh, those high up in industry. But what's the core message to come from this whole COVID-19 situation in your view? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, it, it's as you said in the beginning of our conversation, this is the first time in a, in a century we have a pandemic that affects the whole world. So it is rare that you have such an event that affects all markets where we operate at the same time. Uh, I realize, you know, and it's for many people, it's been a human, uh, dif very difficult situation. Yeah, tragedy. Yeah, yeah and, and, and difficult. I had my own mother being sick, 90 years old, but okay. she very luckily recovered, That's uh, wh which was which good. So I understand that. At the same time, I must say it is so important that we get the economies back in action and the economy, the wheels start to, to turn again. Now, it is important. It is important that the markets open up again, that we are doing it carefully, but we actually do it because the economy is, people need to get back to the jobs. Kids need to go back to school. We need to get you know factories back, consumption coming back, back to normality. We need that. That is so important. And interim will play a, a key supportive role for those as things start to kind of move forward again. Absolutely. I mean, as I said before, we have daily calls with our management team following the gradual opening of the different markets in Europe, making sure that we comply with local 
uh, health regulation, of course, but making sure that we are in the front line uh, and being there to support our clients and customers in every single market where we operate. It's very important. It's core to our business. Absolutely. And so there's signs of hope, even though this is a very, very difficult situation. This is what we can kind of maybe take from, from our conversation today. Yeah, I think so. Great. Mikael Eriksson, thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you.